Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the study this morning. We're going to uh, continue where we left off yesterday. There's lots of things that uh, we need to look at. But before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are very grateful for the time that we have once again this morning to open your word together. We invite your spirit's presence into our hearts, into our lives, into our discussion. We ask that you can enlighten our minds, that we can think clearly, that we can see the things that you want us to see, and that we can correct the things that we have in our thinking that are in error. We pray for each person who is struggling to understand these things and we just pray that the truths here presented will um, encourage and strengthen us in our faith and trust in you. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, I looked over some of the studies that we did when we originally addressed Judges chapter 15. We actually did quite an in-depth study into the 300, and um, uh, so when we did it again the last this week, um, I don't know if we covered too much that was new, except in understanding where we're placing it on a line. So some of this, we, we go over some of the same things, we discuss some of the same things, usually from the same people making the same points, it's always kind of interesting even though we seem to forget, at least I do, what, what exactly we discussed. Now, here we're going to begin looking at uh, the story where Samson is, uh, takes his vengeance. Um, and so the Philistine said, who hath done this? They answered, Samson, son-in-law of the Timnite, because he had taken his wife and given her to his companion the philistines came and burnt her and her father with fire so we address that and um in looking at at this what what's our conclusion about who the father is do we have a conclusion i mean we have a woman that represents a church and we have this father now they're burnt with fire. These are messages. And my suggestion was is that this fire represents the Holy Spirit. But people may disagree with that or have different views on it. Because fire can, of course, represent destruction and judgment, but it also can represent the Holy Spirit. Maybe it even has a twofold application here, and that the Holy Spirit uh, destroys these messages. And are we still having tr time, uh, trouble when we take this story and look at it, uh, trying to understand the ironic nature of it? Is that causing us problems with this passage? Anyone's with anyone with thoughts on this? So um, one of the things about the father, okay, so going back and looking at this situation, when we were looking at this in chapter, um, what was it here? Because they're going to make this agree. Where is this now? Does it mention her father and mother before? That's what I'm trying to. Is this the first time it actually mentions 
for fathers, chapter 15. Because the father is going to offer um, Samson this younger sister. And this is the first time we run into the parents of the, of the Tim Knight, right? Or am I wrong? Because it's going to be, uh, who's going to offer Parminder's teaching to the movement? Doesn't FFA do this? Yes. Okay. So when it talks about um, her father, right? So you got um, the father here, the the wife, the Tim Knight, and then um, this this Tim Knight and her father are going to be burned with fire, in verse six. Um, Mentions the father in verse one. Yeah, the father in verse one. Yeah. I think that's the first mention. Okay. Yeah, and it does. Yeah, that's what I was saying. It, it doesn't mention the mother. I don't think. This time just mentions the father. So you have in this case, you have the father and the Tim Knight. So you got this civil power, right? If you're going to take a man as rep representing civil power, and then this wife representing uh, a church. But we're taking these as representing a message. And remember, we place this story here particularly at the time of wheat harvest. But we can see that there is this invitation, right? So when I was looking at this, I was going to try to put it back to 11.9. When this is offered, in a sense, that's when it's offered. But we can see that this is um, really addressing our history. But is it still being offered is the invitation that was given by FFA, which was really an invitation to accept Parminder's arguments against July 18th and time setting in general, because he's going to use the set. They're going to use his arguments to attack July 18th. So the Omega is being offered. Um, is it still being offered, I guess, is the question. I don't know that that is the question. Well, it's the question I'm asking. I know it is. <laughs> the, the situation right now is, are we still being affected by this message? Well, well that's exactly what I mean by being offered. Is it still a part of the thinking that is going on in the movement? Now, people yes. are always really vocal about what they think about things, right? When, when people have opposition, because I've talked to people um, about some of the stuff in this movement, like people who, you know, don't come to our studies regularly. And they will always say um, the right things. They're not going to show opposition uh, when they're talking to me. But I have had the same people show very strong opposition um, in, in discussions that we've had in our studies. But when I talk to them in, you know, on the phone, it's like none of their objections that they made before or the positions they took before are being mentioned. And, and I, I take this, you know, me personally, because I'm, I'm not a person who hides what I'm thinking. I sort of take this as being duplicitous in that people will say one thing, but think another because they don't think it's expedient for them to say it at that moment. But when you get into a situation, they will then admit all that they were thinking. And I've had that happen a few times. But if I talk to these people later, 
they they don't bring up these issues they act as if you know it's you know what i'm saying is just fine um you know and I, and i guess that's probably fairly normal for people um so so we have this um so we don't know what people are really thinking about all of this chronology at least openly right i mean maybe they do it in some of the discussions when i'm not there uh, some of their private discussions, because I know there's been mocking that's gone on that I've heard the recordings of. Um, but what I think, so this is just my opinion, and I could be wrong, and I'm not trying to do like evil surmising, but I believe that there are people who don't accept July 18th, but give lip service to it. That is, if they were to oppose it, that it would cause problems for them. So and, and not that some even give it lip service. Some just don't say anything when these things come up. So, so they have shown opposition in the past, but when like Stephen will do his presentation on all this chronology, there are people, at least from my imagination, whether that's it's correct or not, but they're silent. And I believe that they're silent because they're opposed, but they don't want to show open opposition. So all I'm trying to say is I believe that there is um, still within the movement a belief system that comes from Parminder, even though people aren't really aware of why they think what they think. Would we... Or could we agree that the movement has, by and large, been infected by this with Parminder, and that the if the infection needs to be dealt with? Yeah. Well, okay. I, I don't to say it needs to be dealt with. I'm not sure particularly what that means. I mean, <clears throat> what I do, you know, as I study and. We have these studies, and we try to understand uh, the lines. We, we looked at the foundation of the message. We looked at different aspects of things. We're looking at righteousness by faith. We're trying to understand these things. Um, I mean, God is the one who's going to have to deal with these things. I mean, I don't know if there's any way that you can address it other than just presenting what you believe to be true. I know that... Um, you know, there's so much that that we've studied that people need to know, but they don't know it because they haven't looked at it, and it would help them. I mean, it would help Colin. If Colin had been in our studies every morning, I'm not saying that he could, could do that, but if he had, or at least he had watched all of our studies, I don't think he would have come to the conclusion that he did on December 25th, 2021. That's that's my view. I don't think he would have gone that direction. I think he would have seen how how we understand the lines and the typical nature of them. I also think that we wouldn't have gone the direction that we did with um, with the Odilio study. We still would have seen these things. We still would have, you know, Odilio still would have measured out these things and saw this structure. And we still would have uh, found the symbol of the 1629. But he would have drawn a different conclusion as far as how that's connected to Trump becoming uh, president again in order to bring in the Sunday law. That is, I'm pretty sure that we, that from what, what we have studied, we can see that the Sunday law cannot come until the work has been done to prepare people for a Sunday law. And in order to do that, this movement, if that's our role, which we believe it is, then this movement has to be united. It has to fulfill its role. To me, it's just it's just simple, simple logic. There's not anything complicated about it. 
but the movement isn't doing anything in that direction. So God's going to have to reform this movement. That is this movement, which is a reform line, still needs to be reformed. So when we look at Samson, if Samson is this message, you know, the message, not just of July 18th, but the message of chronology. Then. Um, his wanting to, to go down to his wife, that is, if we're going to look at the wife as representing the spiritual aspect of the church. But her father is not going to suffer her to come in or him to come in to his wife because he's going to have given the wife to his companion. Now he's going to offer the younger sister. I mean, I would still take that as even though we're placing this with the end of our line, the end of the 777 structure, I still would would say that this is something that was offered to the movement from the time of December 6th, 2020, all the way to December 25th, 2021. Right. And we get to December 25th, 2021, we're going to have these two messages, Collins and then 49 days later, Odilios. And these messages are based upon basically um, taking a position that I think uh, is the reason that FFA gave their declaration on December 6th. That is, we have Colin is saying our, our prediction didn't fail, right? Trump is still going to be the last president of the United States. He's still going to be the 45th president, president because he's going to call himself that. He's not going to accept that he's the 47th, right? This is what Colin was saying. And, and believing that that has to be happen in order for it to be fulfilled. Now, with Odilio's study, what was he trying to do with July 18th? Wouldn't that be sort of similar to what was happening in the 1850s with time setting? I mean, both Collins and Odilius, but. I would have to agree that it looks like it was both of theirs being very similar to that with the 1850s. Yeah, that's that's the way that I look at it. I mean, to me, it seemed quite obvious. It's like, well, we're going to accept you know, July 18th, but, you know, we're going to, we're going to somehow try to extend it. But this is looking very much like a, a repeat of history. Yeah. But, and that's the way we understood it. Even, even before those predictions, when we were looking at uh, early writings, page 74, we started to see that things that were being said were definitely um, aligning themselves with that history. So, so Samson, because he's basically, you know, he doesn't have this wife, you know, he's rebuffed, right? She's given to another companion. He's not going to accept the younger sister. Um, and then he's going to, you know, take out his revenge. And we have this symbol of the 300 and, um, Ran was talking with me before the study about this being a complement, the 65 and the 300 in those diagrams we had, making up a year. So a year is 365 days. And so 300 and 65 are a complement that is there a unit. Um, and we also have this 65 days that is from the first day of the first month to the sixth day of the third month, you have these 65 days. So that also relates to Pentecost. But I would take that when we go back to that history of December 6th, uh, 2020, that that history from December 6th, 2020 to um, February 12th, 2022, where we have that Pentecost at the beginning, 
or P Pentecost at the end, I guess, right? So you have the Pentecost, and then you have December 25th, and that brings us back to that history in December of 2020. So how would we connect that? So, because I'm saying that we need to connect the declaration to as this period of time. Now we got, you know, we got more than a year, right? We have uh, December 6, 2020. I'm just gonna see what I find with this. And then you're going to have, oh, this is kind of interesting. So how many days to December 25th, uh, 2020? From December 6th. If you go from the 6th to the 25th, how many days is that? So we're just going to go to 2020 first. 19. Okay, so you've got 19 days. Now, is 19 and 65 a complement? Uh, maybe that's not the right term, but are they related to each other? Yes. Okay, right? So that 19 days. Now, um, and in that date, December 25th, 2020, we have... One year before December 25th, 2021, we have an event that happens in Nashville, which is a bombing, right? Yes. Right. <clears throat> yeah. And that date is on the biblical calendar, the 10th day of the 10th month, which is the siege. Okay. And then we go one year later, and we get December 25th, 2021. And that date is going to be um, 384 days after December 26th, 2020. And what's the significance of 384? It's the um, length of a Hebrew year with an embolistic month. Yeah, so an em, em, embolis, embolistic, em, a, he, a leap year, right, with an extra month, an embolism, right? So it has that extra month added to it. Okay, so we know that 365 is 300 plus 65, 300 plus Pentecost. But 384 is also another representation of the year. And that's simply if you take 365 and you add 19, you get this 384. And then we, of course, would add the 65 um, days from December 20, let me see, see December 49 days, pardon me, December 25th, 2021, we're going to do this. 49 days and that's going to bring, bring us to february 12th and so there we have a pentecost representation in the 49 days um does that seem a sufficient way to to connect um december 6th to 2020 to december 12th or december 25th 2021 And then does that seem reasonable? Okay. I'll just show you this chart here. All right, so there's your dates, December 6, 2020, December 25, 2020, the 19 days. December 25th, 2021, the 384 days. 
And then of course the 365 there. And then the 49 days to February 12th. And then we have the December 25th, 2022 date. But we also have other dates that we could put in there. Um, so we have the end of Collins prediction. So if I put that there, so which is tomorrow. Okay, so I'm looking at this. Any anything anybody wants to comment about these dates? I was just thinking about um, June 22nd, 2020 was when the advertisement at Nashville came and then that was 187 days inclusive reckoning to December 25th, the Nashville bombing. Yeah, so if I and, go here, yeah, so if I go there and put in, sorry, it's just when I zoom in, it goes like this. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that, that's easier. Um, whoops, I went the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, so we got the June 22nd date. From there, you can see the 186. Okay, so we've got that in there. So what would we do with that now? Stephen? Yeah, I was just thinking um, in 1844, that was the date of uh, Samuel Snow's, yeah, Pentecost and Samuel Snow's third letter. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the 65th day of that year then. Uh, and then, so, you had, yeah, and from, then you had from, yeah, from April 19th. Yes. Yeah. And then you had 187. It would take you on the 25th of December. Yeah. 1844, inclusive reckoning. So I don't know, just kind of matches that. Uh, Enoch to um, Methuselah being born. Okay, so the so sixty five and the one eighty seven being the two fifty. To yeah, to sorry to Lamech being born. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if it ties in with this here. Just just a, a thought. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to put the numbers in there so that I could see if it does anything. All right, so. So I'm asking you get the, the number just like 600. Yeah, I was just looking at that. So to from that date to Odilio's uh, study is going to be 600 days exactly. And, uh, and you can have 434 inclusive reckoning from December 6th. To that date as well. So um, be Sixty-two weeks. Uh, so the four hundred and fourteen, you're talking about four hundred and thirty-four. Oh, oh, the four thirty-four. Right. Yes. Impressive. Okay. 
Yeah, so if we were to count this date here to February 12th, um, that would be an inclusive count. So that's the complement of two two three forty three, right? That to get the seven seven seven. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So there's you know definitely some uh, interesting things here in in. in the main thing that I'm trying to do, though, is I'm connecting what happened on December 6th, 2020, that that still is something that is being addressed by this message. Now, I don't know because I wasn't watching all of the studies for the last year. I don't know how often they refer to what happened on December 6th, 2020, the declaration, whether they mention it often. Or if, if it's mentioned, who would mention it? What other people's thoughts are on that? I don't know. But um, we see it as a major way mark. Right. And, and we did a study dealing with that whole dissolution of, of and the relationship of FFA to um, uh, July 18th. Right. And so one of the things we noted is that it, it was... From July 18th to the sale of the School of the Prophets was how many days? Only at seven. 187 days, right? So that was, you know, definitely not some random, um, random event, right? So on January 21st, 2021, uh, the school is going to be sold, right? And listed for sale one eight seven days before July eighteen. It it's what? It's listed for sale one hundred eighty seven days before July eighteen, as well. <clears throat> Brother oh, oh. yeah. So you're saying if we go back to it was the thirteenth? Was it listed for sale? What was the date? I think that's right, the 13th. And then if you count 187 days, it brings you inclusive count to July 18th again, 2021. Brother Theodore. Yep. You, you read that book, Sanctuary and the, three, the 2300 Days of Daniel 8, 14. Have you read it? Uh, which which book is that? Who wrote it? <clears throat> it's written by Uriah Smith, the sanctuary and the three hundred and the two twenty three hundred days of Daniel eight fourteen. No, I've never read that book. Yeah, well, I just looked on the first page where it says the prefix and the um the address it was written the um time it was written is it says U S July. 1877.7. Okay. So, and it, and it has something to do with the um, prophecy lines. Okay. So, this, where, where do you find this book? It's the sanctuary and the 300. The okay, 2300. What are you looking at it? Where are you? Do you have the actual physical book? I have the actual physical book. Okay. I don't got the original book. It's a recopy, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so in the the book itself. So I'm just yeah. The prefix. The prefix. Uh, the the first page. I think it's page five on this book. Okay. Down at the bottom, it gives the date. But when it, I reckon when it was written. I thank you, Rod uh, Smith, for it. I ain't sure. Okay. Um, yeah. It'd be nice if you could give me like a photo of that. I mean, I might be able to find it online. <clears throat> 200 days in the sanctuary. 
Well, I don't know if I can give you a photo because I don't know how I'm going to do that. But I can, I don't know. You don't have a cell phone? Yeah, I got one. You take a picture of the cell phone and then you just uh, uh, yeah, email it to yourself or email it to me. You just select the picture and email it. Okay. And that one was published when? This this prefix was um, published. Yeah, it was um, published July eighteen seventy seven point seven. Okay. It's kind of weird. I, I can't find this book. I got it in my hands. <clears throat> yeah, I know. I just I thought I could find it online easily, but I can't. <clears throat> yeah. send, me a, send me a picture of that. Okay, I will. Okay. So when, when we get to um, verse six, so it says the burnt her and her father with fire. That's really where we started here today. Um, you know, I'm taking this fire as representing the Holy Spirit, but it's also a destructive force. And, and to me, this is talking about the end of FFA, but not, not just FFA itself, but also the teachings that were contrary to the truth, not, not what Jeff was teaching, but the things that came out of FFA through people like Parminder and then the actions of the committee that uh, put out the declaration. So the question is, how does that happen? If I'm saying this is the Holy Spirit, in what way is Samson's revenge enacted in our time. Now, how about 15 verse 7? And Samson said unto them, Though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I will cease. And the question that I have in, in how I'm trying to understand this, and I could be completely wrong, but here Samson is representing a message. And this destruction of this message that where the Philistines burn it with fire. Remember, we, we have this ironic story, which is really hard to flip around sometimes because we have to decide how to do that. But Samson represents Christ. And we know that, that the, the, when is Samson avenged of what has happened in this story? When is he going to be avenged? That's when he uh, destroys the temple. Okay. So ultimately, his, he's going to be avenged when he destroys the temple of Dagon, right? Now, he is still going to be... Um, like in this in this story, he's going to have where he's going to uh, kill all these people, right? With the as we go through this here, so we're going to see how this works, and so we're going to have to try to understand this. But that's not really going to be where he is avenged. At least that's not how I take it. And so when he says yet. Uh, yet will I be av avenged. What does the word yet mean? I mean, just in English. Because we don't use it this way very often. If I said I am yet to be 
avenged of you. How would we take that word yet? So if we just add a little bit more. Sometime in the future. Yeah, so this is going to be future, right? That is, there is a continuation going on. Okay, so would 15.7, as you're, as you're looking at this right now, or as we are looking at this, yeah. could this be equated with December 6th of 2020? Okay, and how are you doing that? Well, we're equating a lot of this right now as being this message of, of Parmender that has to be destroyed. Yeah. We're also saying that this is yet to occur in the future. So, so it's being avenged of what happened on December 6th. Right. Okay. And that's kind of where, I, where I'm going. But the other, the other thing that I'm looking at, as we're looking at this with 157, mm -hmm. this precedes 158. Yeah, which 158 I'm taking is the main verse in this chapter. Okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. So symbolically, it's leading us to this 158 where we understand that we should not have been, we should not have entered into this agreement from the symbol of 158. Yeah. So, so this is the midnight cry. And I mean, to understand the agreement, of course, we're not talking about some formal agreement, but just an agreement with a message that was error. Right? Because we responded. You know, every single one of us who rejected Parminder's message, um, I would say pretty much the main thing that we saw, um, you know, and I can't include everyone there, but, you know, it was the whole wokeness of it all, right? The acceptance of homosexuality, the rejection of dress reform, um, all of these things. It was moving in the direction that the church had been moving and, you know, they even started to use the Sabbath school quarterly in their studies on Sabbath for Sabbath school. At least the group in, in Arkansas was. So, so we, we could all, you know, reject that part of it, but not recognize that we had entered on Satan's ground and we really were the same. That is our reasons for, and we saw this in the, in the political aspects of this movement, that a lot of this was a, a conservative reaction to liberalism. It wasn't a spiritual reaction to error. Um, because you just were trading one error for another. And, and particularly right after about Parminder, when I listened to uh, the meetings from Arkansas, um, there was a lot of what I call boasting about the fact that people had rejected Parminder's message. Um, I didn't think it was uh, seemly um, to do that, right? And to me, it just seemed... You know, kind of arrogant. I mean, to think about well, we just we just rejected Parminder. We just we never did accept what he said. Brother uh, Theodore, did you get yeah. them uh, emails? Um, let me see. I haven't got them yet. But if, if you sent them, they should get here. All right. I just all right. I just found it interesting. It had that that you lined in ahead eighteen seventy seven and then it had a um seven on the end of it. Yeah. 
yeah, so I want to see what that is. Okay. Um, so where were we again? So dealing with the political aspects of, of what was happening, the sympathy we would have with, um, you know, people protesting the, the mandates and all those types of things. And really, if we, if we look at what Jones had presented in the 1893 General Conference Bulletin, were we right? In, in sympathizing with the protests. Let's put it that way. Because Jones talked about how you know, they did the petitions, but now is no more time for petitions. You know, it's a done thing. Would it help us to protest? Would that be a good use of our, our time? No, it will not. It will no. not at all. No. And, and I don't think we should even have, I mean, I understand the sympathy that we have with, with, the types of protests and things that happen and, and the peaceful nature of them even. Um, but that is not our battle, is it? Isn't that an alliance with the world? Aren't we on Satan's ground? Yes. That we can't win? As, as Joan says, you can't win that battle, right? Because this is this is Satan's kingdom, and you will lose. You know, he that takes up the sword shall perish by the sword. Well, let me ask you something. Or yeah. could you could you uh, could you go to these uh, protests and, and hand out books to people, or, and not be a part of the protests? Um, well, you could. And not be a part of the protest, but I expect if you was going to the protest to give out books, they might consider you as, it'd be like, you know, sustaining from evil. If you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I understand what you're talking about. Um, I wouldn't go, I mean, I'm not going to go to them. I'm just saying it. I just think I was just thinking it would be all right to go give them books, like and dealing on like great controversy and stuff like that. I guess it's I guess it would be okay. I don't know. That's not generally how I work, but I mean there are some people who like handing out books to people randomly. Well, I used to do it all the time. I yeah, well, I, I I used to go door to door giving away great controversies and things like that. But but I'm just saying that. Um, whether that's the best place to do that, I don't know. But I don't think it's wrong. I mean, the, the main thing I'm talking about is being political. Getting caught up in the politics. Getting caught up in the emotion, the outrage. All of these things that Satan wants us to do because it detracts us from our mission. And, and we're not gonna we're not gonna win that battle. Right. I mean, we are to warn people of what's coming. But in it, you know, like when you try to tap into, let's use that word, tap into the emotion that people have against the mandates and, and all the different things happening. Are you going to be able to direct people in the right direction by tapping into that emotion? The church tries to do this type of stuff all the time. It's not going to work. Yeah, it doesn't work. It doesn't bring about converted people. It doesn't attract the right people. Because we like to be focused upon this external enemy instead of on the internal enemy, the one that we actually need to defeat. And... I mean, that's really if you, you're going to 
boiled down Jones argument. It's that we need to be connected with Christ because he is more powerful than the world. He's overcome the world. And, and the thing that overcomes the world is the cross. So for a Christian to sort of stand up for his rights, you know, I mean, we can, we can be outraged by it, but it's not going to do us any good. And it's not going to, and if we're trying to appeal to people because, well, people are upset about, you know, the mandates and we can, um, you know, present our message to them and what we believe, you know, about the Sunday law and that this is the start of the Sunday law and all these types of things, because that's the talk that I've heard. That somehow this is how we reach people. And then we're, we're really on their ground. I mean, they're not on our ground. And if we go on their ground, we're not going to be able to invite them over to our ground because we're on their ground. We're caught up in it as well. So, so the question is, how is this, um, how is this work going to be done? How it, what is this describing? This, he burnt and, and they burnt her and her father with fire. The Philistines do this. Now, Samson, of course, needs to be avenged, right, because of this. So, you know, the, the story becomes complicated in how we're, we're dealing with these symbols. But Samson is going to experience the cross, right? He's going to give his life for the message, right? Okay, let's let's address this next part, and we, we'll come back to these things again. Um, and he smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter, and he went up, down and dwelt on the top of the rock Etam. Then the Philistines went up and pitched in Judah and spread themselves in Lehi. And the men of Judah said, why are you come up against us? And they answered, to bind Samson we are come up, to do to him as he hath done to us. So, so the Philistines are going to go into Judah because that's where Samson is. And then 3,000 men of Judah went to the top of the rock Etam and said to Samson, Knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? That what is this that thou hast done unto us? And he said unto them, As they did unto me, so I have done unto them. And they said unto him, We are come down to bind thee, that we may deliver thee into the hand of the Philistines. And Samson said unto them, Swear unto me, that ye will not fall upon me yourselves. And they spake unto him, saying, No, but we will bind thee fast and deliver thee into their hand. But surely we will not kill thee. And they bound him with two new cords and brought him up from the rock. And when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the cords that were upon his arms became his flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands loosed from off his hands. And he found a new jawbone of an ass, and put forth his hand, and took it, and slew a thousand men therewith. And Samson said, with the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of an ass have I slain a thousand men. And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking, that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand and called that place Ramoth Lehi. And he, so we'll just stop there um, in, in this section here. Now, <clears throat> so he's going to do this great slaughter in verse 8, right? He smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter. Doesn't tell us how many people he killed. But that's how we understand that, right? Now, what about this great slaughter? How do we understand this?
So if we look up great slaughter, do we have any great slaughters in the Bible? Okay, so we have uh, Joshua 10.10. 10. And the Lord discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gideon and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Horon and smote them to Azekah and unto Mekedah. Remember studying that. And also to 1020. It's going to mention the great slaughter as well. He had made an end of slaying them with a great slaughter. Um, and we have in Judges 11.33, and he smote them from Aurora, even till thou come to Minneth, even 20 cities, and unto the plain of the vineyards, with a very great slaughter. And of course, Judges 15.8, for Samuel 4.10, the Philistines fought and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man to his tent. There was a very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. Uh, 1 Samuel 4, verse 17, the messengers answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also a great slaughter. All right, so you're going to see lots of these great slaughters, sometimes in connection with the Philistines, sometimes other, other things. And there was war again, uh, 1 Samuel 19, 8, and, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and slew them with a the great slaughter. 1 Samuel 23, 5, again, the Philistines, he smoked them with a great slaughter. All right, so we have all these great slaughters, um, lots of them. Then you have Jacob being touched by God in the hip. Yeah, so we have the hip thing. Um. There's this one, Isaiah 30, 25. There shall be upon every high mountain and upon every high hill, rivers and streams of waters in the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall. Talks in Isaiah 34 about a great slaughter in the land of Idumea, which would be Edom. Um, and... We also have, um, and I somehow seem to miss it, but uh, okay, so this is uh, dealing with um, the 13th day of the month, Adar, and the 14th day of the same, rested they and made a day of feasting and gladness. They smote their enemies with a great slaughter. This is just uh, the words of Sylvester Bliss. But talking about that, he compares that to a great slaughter. And the one that I'm thinking of most um, importantly, so I'll show you this one. <clears throat> Sir, it is over, it is done. The British fleet has struck to the American flag, great slaughter on both sides. They're in plain view where I'm now writing. My God, the sight was majestic, it was noble, it was grand. This morning at 10 o'clock, the British opened a very heavy and destructive fire upon us, both by water and land. Their Congreve rockets flew like hailstones about us and round shot and grape from every quarter. We have no idea of the battle. Our force was small, but how bravely they fought. Sir, Sir Lord George Provost feels bad. His land force may expect to meet their fate if our militia do their duty. But in time of action, they were not to be seen. The action on water lasted only two hours and ten minutes. The firing of their batteries has but, has but just ceased. Ours is still continuing. The small arms now are just coming to action. 
I've no time to write any more. You must conceive what we feel, for I cannot describe it. I am satisfied that I can fight. I know I am no coward. Therefore, call on Mr. Loomis and drink my health, and I will pay the shot. Three of my men are wounded by a shell which burst within two feet of me. A boat of the fleet, which had just landed under a fort, says the British Commodore is killed. Out of 300 on board their ship, 25 remain alive. Some of our officers who have been on board say the blood is knee deep. Their force we have taken consists of one ship, 36 guns, one brig of 18 guns, and two sloops. Huzza, huzza. 20 or 30 British prisoners taken by our militia have just arrived in Fort. I can write no more, for the time grows dubious. Yours forever, William Miller. Give my compliments to all and send this to my wife. And so this is, of course, from Fort Scott, September 11th, 1814, 20 minutes past two o'clock. Okay, so why do I bring this up? Because it was written at 1440. Um, okay. I'm, being, I, I'm just looking at the at the timestamp, but this is being brought up in 1814. Okay, 1440. You said twenty minutes after two p.m. would be fourteen forty hours. Wouldn't that be fourteen twenty hours? Excuse me, you're right. You're right. I'm wrong. But we have the symbol of 220. Right. Okay. We also have September 11th. We also have this great slaughter. We also have 300 on board the ship. Right. Okay. All sorts of symbols. All kinds of symbols. Um, um, you know, three of my men are wounded by a shell with, which burst within two feet of me. Um, of course, the September 11th date. Now, we know that this is in William Miller's line. Um, it's also connected to September 11th, uh, 1816, when he's going to be converted. So two years later, he's going to be converted. And then from that time in 1818... After, or 1816, after two years of study in 1818, he comes to the conclusion about within 25 years from now, uh, in 1843, Christ will return. Okay, and then uh, Iran put loud cry followed by a thousand slain. Okay, so that's what you're saying that um, regarding this verse in Judges chapter 15, verse 8. Now, in that, that huzza huzza thing, too, of William Miller's, I, I'm, I'm not really familiar with that expression, however it's pronounced. Um, but, of course, we noticed the doubling of it. Um, so he smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter, and he went and dwelt, went down and dwelt on the top of the rock Edom. So this is going to be in Judah. Now, we, we noted that in Signs of the Times, Ellen White had Elam, though it seems that that would have been a typo. That just ended up in uh, and somehow in the printing of it. Could have been even in just reading or handwriting or something that they thought it said Elam, not seeing that a T was clearly crossed or whatever. But but anyway, it ended up there. And so we had some discussions regarding that before. Um So, so what does this great slaughter here in 158 have to do with, with William Miller 
on September 11th, 1814? Or does it have anything to do with it? I noticed that um, one of the, the great slaughters that you mentioned, yep. Samuel, is um, which one? First, first Samuel four seventeen. Yeah. At the height of the twin towers was four hundred and seventeen meters. Okay. Yeah, so one thing is we connect this great slaughter to 9-11, right? That's, that's the way that I understand it. And we connect 9-11 to 11-9, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So in addressing this then in um, what's happening in Judges 15 verse 8, I mean, we're, we're taking this symbol here and attaching it to our line. So we're not looking at 9-11 per, per se, but we're looking at um, a destruction of a message. Now, one of the things we, we know about our lines that, uh, that we've come to understand is that our all of our lines, everything that we've been involved in since 1989, is a zoom into the Sunday Law Waymark on Ellen White's big line. It is um, the Sunday Law is uh, has this repeat of history that precedes it that Ellen White talks about that parallels Millerite history, and. You know, we begin that at 1989. We particularly see that 9-11 has this connection to the Sunday law. And that's with the changes that happened in the United States um, with 9-11. And it also affects the church as well. But we're, we're applying this here to our movement at the present time. But we're taking these symbols from the past and showing what is being conquered, what Samson's work is, in this application of how we're taking Samson. Doesn't mean there isn't a larger application that can be made of Samson, because we know he represents Christ. So there's definitely larger applications. Now, this is uh, Hawk's Ground, Etam, the rock Etam. So he dwelt on top of this rock, Eden. And then the Philistines, they go to Judah, right? They're going to pitch in Judah, spread themselves in Lehi. And Lehi refers to, what is Lehi? Why is the place called Lehi in the first place? Yeah, it's a jawbone, right? Or it's a jaw, right? And and of course he's going to use the jawbone of an ass to to kill further people. So, I mean, the name of the place I believe was called Lehi afterwards, but you know they just referred to it as Lehi even before they described the event that gave it the name Lehi. Now they want to bind Samson, and it takes three thousand men of Judah. They go to the top of the rock, Eton, and they say, basically, you know, the Philistines are rulers over us. What have you done? And he said, well, he said unto them that uh, they started it. Okay. So, so Samson here is um, going to submit to the men of Judah. 
right? Now, why is he bound with two new cords? So what are these chords representing? What can chords represent? Okay, line upon line, the things that are entwined. Um, interwoven okay and in verses we can look at this that word is translated as wreathen as cords as thick as bands as boughs as chains as ropes as band as branches are they a type of restraint okay, it's a type of restraint Yeah, they could, it's definitely a type of restraint. But they're, they're going to be used in uh, the sanctuary as well, like the word is used, uh, dealing with uh, chains on the, the high priest's uh, breastplate, holding it and so forth. Um And um, definitely when it's used as chains, it could refer to restraints. But often it's just referring to uh, something that is not necessarily restraining. Now we know that he's going to use this, the same word is going to be the one that he talks about, um, where it says new ropes, if they bind me with fast with new ropes in chapter 16. It's going to be that same word, chords, right? So they bound me with new chords. Obviously, that's already happened in chapter 15, and it didn't work. And then there's two of them. So what's the two have to do with anything? Two new chords. New understanding of the Old and New Testament. Okay. But they're going to bind him with these things. And he should have been bound to God by his vow as a Nazarite or his upbringing as a Nazarite. Yeah. So, so it seems to me that Samson is being placed under a type of discipline sort of against his will from a moral point of view. But the symbols here can be used positively. Right. Um, could we, so we have the two here. So we had the two loaves, we had the two charts, we had the two... Uh, studies, Collins and Odilius. Can this have any part to play in this? Could these be an interrelation with the two chords? Mm -hmm. and, and remember when it talks about uh, binding in scripture, that this can refer to prophecy, correct? Correct. Right. There's lots of different ways in which that's symbolized. Um, okay. So, and this word here, bind thee fast, um, is just asar, asar, right? That is uh, to yoke or hitch by analogy to fasten in any sense. 
to join battle, bind, fast, gird, harness, hold, keep, make, ready, order, prepare, prison, put in bonds, set in array, tie, right? So it says we will bind thee fast. Um, and so they're just using the word fast in the sense that we'll bind you very tightly in um, now in the Hebrew, it's going to uh, uh, have this word here, asar, asar, and then nas, nasara. So it's just, uh, this is just um, uh, an ending here that saying that we will bind you. Bind, we will bind, right? That is what it says. <clears throat> Uh, so we have a doubling there. Okay, so is that significant in this binding that we can see that this is a symbol? Any thoughts on that doubling there? And we're looking at this in the Hebrew in what verse? 1513. Okay. Right, that's where it's doubled. Okay. Yeah, so I was looking at it here. That's the Asar Nahasara. Right. So it's both 631 is the, the number. We will, we will bind thee fast. That's how it's translated in King James. So they bind him with two new cords, brought him up from the rock. And when he came unto Lehi, the Philistine shouted against him. The spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire. And his bands loosed from off his hands. So here again, we have this fire. Of course, it's just a symbol. It's not literally a fire here. It's just by analogy um, that these are cords just did not bind him. And then he's going to take this jawbone of an ass. So we know that this is going to symbolize Islam. And a thousand men are going to be killed. So you have 3,000 men of Judah who go and get him from, from the rock. When he comes back, and he's brought back by the Philistines, he's going to kill 1,000 of them. Okay, so what does this mean? And Samson's going to say, you know, I've... Um, with the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of an ass, I have slain a thousand men. So again, you're going to have this doubling. Hamorah, heap. It's only mentioned here in Judges 15, 16. So this word is doubled. 
Okay, but in 1513, yeah. I see the doubling of the bind thee fast, but what does it mean when you have a doubling separated by another word? Um, well, we don't really have it separated by another word. No, I'm, I'm speaking of when you look at the portion that says, but surely we will not kill. And you have Hebrew 4191. Yeah, so you just have this word here. That That's just the, the prefix to the word. That just That's just the prefix not. So if you look at it in Hebrew, um, in Judges 13, like it's not really a separate word. No, I'm saying separated. Yeah, I'm saying, yeah, okay, here it is actually in the Hebrew. They Instead of putting it as a prefix, so often what they will do is, this is the word lo. Now, often what they do is they just attach it to uh, the front of the word, right? Now, I would think here, I'm just going to look this up. Um, let's see what they do here. Yeah, so vahamet. Low, uh, and then what you have is you have this prefix at the so this is the hithfil form, um, to die, right? Um, ne me techa. So, so what it's doing here is, I mean, these words are in quite different forms, but the, the, instead of attaching, and the reason why they can't attach the lamid to the word is because it has these other prefixes already. So they just put it as a separate word, low, right? Um, so the question is, what does that mean? Is that truly a doubling? I mean, is, are you saying, is it a chiasm? Well, I, you know, when I saw that, I didn't understand if it was a doubling, a chiasm, or what we're looking at. Okay. Because we're looking at this where we have the doubling uh, where we find bind thee fast. Yeah. The word is repeated where it says, and they bound, because that's still part of bind thee fast, part of the doubling. Yeah. So they're going to have the same word. Yep. But they brought him up from the rock. They brought him up from Selah. Yeah, Sila, yeah, to be lofty. They brought him up from the fortress. They brought him up from a stronghold. So he's he's having in in this in this manner. If we look at it literally, he's having to give up his position of strength. Now I don't know how we would look at that in the ironic sense, or if we would. But well, it's not morally ironic. So, right. right. But yeah, okay. Well, we have all these symbols here in this story dealing with these doublings. Okay. We also have, you know, the symbol of Islam, right? And then Samson's proclamation or whatever you want to call it. Um, so in verse 17, it says, it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand and called that place, Ramoth, Lehi, right? So that's the, uh, the height of the jawbone, Ramoth referring to like an area of height, like a hill or something like that. I mean, one of the things is we see that Islam comes into play in all of this, because we've seen that time and time again in Judges. 
And we don't know what that means. I mean, is it just that we once again go back to understanding the role of that Islam has to play in these things? I mean, if there's anything that sort of bothered me about what happened after July 18th is, um, you know, the focus began to shift to the pandemic and to the different conspiracy theories regarding that. Now, of course, some of those conspiracy theories, you know, there is actual things that are factual. Um, there are some things that are still just speculation, but... Um, so, so, so not all the things, you know, just because something's labeled a conspiracy theory doesn't mean it is just a theory. It doesn't mean that it, there isn't facts behind it. There definitely was a lot of speculation that hasn't panned out. But the movement away Islam is put into the background, right? Right. And yet we believe that Islam had this role. and and. And that's not even in any of these predictions, really. Um, definitely not in Collins. Uh, Odilia still sort of is holding on to some things about Islam, but I'm not sure exactly how he sees the part they would play in the pandemic or things like that. Um, or the mandates or any of that kind of stuff. Do we think it's possible that, um, I mean, I'm not trying to speculate on the time, but that something's going to happen in this world that, uh, you know, will lead to what we predicted at, at Nashville on July 18, 2020. I mean, are we still looking that that's going to happen, not just way off in the future somewhere, but still a part of the events that we experience prior to the Sunday law. I mean, I guess another way to ask the question, is there going to be some, some event of biblical proportions besides this pandemic that, that we should expect to see? I would think yes, but I wouldn't know what to to ascribe it to. Yeah. But the one thing, so so with the pandemic idea, I mean, when we started looking at, you know, what's going to happen in the United States, I mean, I, I'm of the opinion that the pandemic can only hold people in fear for so long at a certain time, um, no matter how much you start you know, no matter how many different uh, um, strains of uh, that we see, many different strains we see, we're still going to end up with people just not interested in what's happening. There's always going to be a handful of people that are frightened, but most people are just, any people I talk to, they just, you know, they just think the whole thing's silly now. Right, so it's, it's not gonna have the hold upon people that it had in the past. So if you look at how these things work, don't we usually get some something happening, then we get a reprieve and then something happens again, and then we get a reprieve and something happens again and we start to become conditioned by these events? Conditioned or jaded? Well, both. Uh, depends on the person. I mean, in some ways, we become desensitized. But we also end up giving up our freedoms each time. I mean, this is a preparation to bring in other things. Right? Right? Agreed. 
so we shouldn't look at the events of the last few years as sort of their whole um you know the whole plan i, I mean if it's part of satan's plan it's it's just a small part of it it's one of the steps maybe 9 11 was a step you know people gave up their freedom for safety so you know we we see what happens when people are frightened and you need something new to frighten them whatever that's going to be i don't know but i do think islam is going to take up its role again at some point okay anyway we need to close with prayer and we're going to come back to this slowly picking through this trying to figure out how we're going to put this the rest of this on the line uh, tomorrow so let's close with prayer dear father in heaven we are grateful for the time that we've had here we know that um, as we look at all of these symbols we still have not sorted them out lord we ask for your wisdom that we can put them together that all can see them clearly um, continue to help us in our personal study. Be with each person who are watching these videos. And uh, we ask that you can be with this movement, with your church, which though, for those who are seeking for light, Lord, we ask that, that you can um, help us to be a light. Be with us now and throughout this day, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.